Okay, so we've in the last video I showed half of what cryptography is about, which is how does Alice manage her personal private keys? The other half of cryptography is, of course, how does Alice talk to Bob? And that's what we're going to be looking at this in this uh, video. How do we achieve contact exchange? Hello, I'm Phil Pan Baker, and this is continuing my series of podcasts on the mesh. The mesh makes computers easy to use by making them more secure. So I've shown the basic components and I've shown how to apply those components to achieve mutual authentication for device connection. From this point on, I'm going to take all the details of the uh, protocols and so on as read. You know, I've shown you the basic tools of cryptography. Let's just skip past those and go to what the effect is. So I'm not going to drill down into the mechanism, but we've got our UDF fingerprints, we've got our DARE data envelopes, and we've got our meta cryptography. But we can use this to do more than just connect de devices. So how do we use, apply it to contact exchange? Well, the core of the mesh is about synchronizing Alice's device keys and the public keys that she uses for other people. So in her mesh service, there is a catalog that has all her contacts that she, you know, Bob, Carol, Doug. And once a contact is in that catalog, uh, that contact can be shared with e between any of Alice's connected devices. So her laptop, her phone, her digital straw, whatever, they can all connect. So the first question, so the question then is how does the contact get in there in the first place? And the answer is that it depends upon how close Alice is to Bob. You know, just as it, when we were connecting a device, it depended upon the mechanism we use, depended upon the affordances of the device. How we're going to authenticate another user depends upon the circumstances in which we meet them. And we're going to need different approaches for connecting to somebody who we are meeting in person, to somebody who we've ever only ever contacted via the internet. And we're going to need a different approach again if the party that we're establishing a trust relationship with isn't actually a person, but a person working for an enterprise like a bank and it is actually the enterprise that we're authenticating rather than the person themselves. So the first thing that we need is a contact, uh, a contact card for Alice. So Alice has her contact card and of course it is signed by Alice's mesh account. And this can, this can contain all the statements about all the ways that people can contact Alice. So her mesh service address, also her legacy SMTP, Jabber, uh, SSH, um, you know, Signal, Telegram, etc. All the possible ways that Alice might want to allow somebody to contact her. And of course, if she just puts that data out there, she's going to get scam spammed up the wazoo. So we're going to have to encrypt that document. And again, we use the UDF encryption, encrypted authenticated resource locator scheme to put that card on an ordinary website somewhere where it can be downloaded by whoever needs it. But only the party that has the decryption key is going to be able to make use of it. So this is the first way that Alice can pass her credentials to Bob or Doug or Carol or whoever. She has the, she puts her contact information into that uh, document. She puts it in the website 
or she uploads it to the mesh and the mesh service figures out all the plumbing for her and then uh, she puts the QR code of that UDF onto her uh, business card and now all somebody needs to do is to scan Alice's business card and they've got all the content data contact information that Alice is providing and unlike a regular business card this is contact information that can be updated so we don't need to worry about the um, it's not a fixed thing like you know if I give you my business card it becomes obsolete almost as soon as I've passed it over very rare that somebody has every item on the business card is correct pushing it onto a web service means that it can be automatically updated and having the encryption there means that people can't just you know, s scrape the website and find out who is there. So we've put that information into the cloud and we can exchange it via a QR code on a business card. Another way that we can do it, uh, if Alice meets Bob, sorry, if Alice meets Carol in person, they can bump Q QR codes via phone. So one of them brings up their mesh management tool. It presents a QR code that has been generated for that single time. It has a unique PIN number embedded into it. And now when Alice, when uh, Carol scans it, she pulls up the information and we've got a bilateral exchange can be made possible. And so again, we're going to need some sort of a uh, four corner uh, communication scheme uh, as in based and this is again we use mesh messaging for this so we have Alice here and in this case we've got Carol so Carol is going to push a contact request to Carol Carol is going to accept it and the response is and send a response back saying yes I've accepted your request and here's my information and so when we're doing that dynamic QR code we're actually we're doing a remote contact request uh, same as we would do for something somebody that Alice has never met uh, only this time because they're both doing it at the same time and we generated that QR code fresh for each instance we can put a pin code into it, a one-time authenticator, and everything can be authenticated in the moment and everything just happens. The most general case though, Alice isn't talking to Carol who she meets every day, but instead she's meeting Doug. And D she's talking to Doug, and Doug she's never met. Doug is the other side of the world and they only know each other through other internet contacts. And so for this particular um, application, Alice, there's one, as I said, all mesh messaging is subject to access control. But there's one type of mesh message that most people, not everybody, most people will accept by default, and that's the request for a connection. So a connection, mesh connect, contact request, is a very short message. It's limited to a very short number of characters. It cannot contain images. It cannot contain links. All it can do is to say, here's my credentials. Please, can I connect to you? And that's all. And Doug can say yes or can say no and done. Okay, so Alice can connect to somebody remotely what if Alice is wanting to connect to Bob, who is managing, who, who, who is ba Alice's bank manager? Well, we can use any of these schemes that I've described up to now, except that we want one more thing, which is the ability to authenticate the bank. And this is something that is actually really difficult to do unless you bring a trusted third party into the equation and this is where we I believe that we need to engage the web PKI 
Because one of the things that CAs do really well is to authenticate organizations, companies, government departments. They've got 30 years of experience of doing that and we should leverage that existing expertise for the purpose of establishing trust with businesses. Don't need to do it for Alice meeting Carol in the park, but for Bob, the bank manager, yes. For that case, we want a trusted third party. So we've got the uh, contacts um, are being updated. Uh, what more can we do with this? Okay, so at this point, we can exchange contracts between Alice, Bob, Carol, and Doug, and can even exchange them with Bob's bank and organizations and so on. But uh, let's go back to Vince Cerf's slogan, the internet is for everyone. And that means people like Madonna and Britney Spears and all those celebrities for whom maintaining their contacts is actually a real pain. Because imagine you're a celebrity for a moment and so you get um, an aggressive fan gets hold of your personal phone number. Okay, that phone no number has suddenly become useless to you. You're getting hundreds of calls an hour on that phone and you just can't use it anymore. So you have to change your number. And some celebrities, you know, they'll be changing their phone number every three months. And you know, all those personal assistants and all the flunkies that um, follow celebs around. Well, one of the functions that they provide is networking so that when one of them has changed their phone number, they can get back into the, uh, get back in touch with all their own friends and, um, you know, get get back on the party scene and so on. So this can be a real hassle. And, you know, it's not just the celebrity approach. It's not just the inbound. It's also the outbound as well. I mean, uh, I've had the privilege of working with some of the very top people in my field, people like Tim Berners-Lee. And yes, that's good. Uh, but there are a whole load of folk that I only know through, you know, first and second connections or whatever. And some of them can get in touch with me because they've got my contact information. Others can't. Wouldn't it be nice if I could say, well, you know, anybody who's got a Grammy, got a Nobel Prize, you know, anybody who's uh, got a Turing Award. Yes, I'll just take their messages from them because, you know, if that person in that caliber wants to get in touch with me and they're really of that caliber you know they're really who they say that I want to talk to them and then again we have that other problem of you know there's a couple of Russian pranksters who keep calling up politicians impersonating other politicians for their uh, it's a crank phone call show and their targets of politicians which sounds really funny, and some of the some of the calls have been uh, hilarious. Others have been truly worrying. Uh, but you know, the fact that one person who's in a crisis can't pick up the phone and talk to another, and you know they can't hash it out and be sure that they're talking to the right person. That is degrading our ability to have political discourse. So we want to be able to solve all those types of problems. And the way that I see us potentially doing it in the mesh is with trusted introducers and with notarized contacts. Okay, what do I mean? Well, um, well, the simplest uh, approach. Okay, so we've got Alice here. Alice wants to talk to Britney Spears sends a message to her outbound service and then at Brittany's inbound service instead of the response going to Brittany the request going to Brittany it goes to Brittany's PA who gates it 
and only if she accepts it does it go back and go out to Brittany. So that's one way that we can handle these uh, by having kind of like a butler, uh, you know, a gatekeeper person, but it, it's a person. Uh, how can we automate that? And how can we leverage the fact that you know, we, are, we belong to professional societies, we belong to dining clubs, we have social networks. How can we leverage those connections? And how can we mo leverage the fact that we have multiple connections? So say I go to a conference. Well, the conference can run a notarization server just for this conference. And so everybody who visits the conference who wants to can get their mesh account notarized at this conference. And that then provides a proof that they were there at that conference. And because we've got the internotary going, we'll be able to timestamp that to a particular point in time. Now consider uh, notary chains have a really interesting property in that the work factor goes from essentially zero to infinity at the moment you put a document into the chain. So imagine that we have a timeline here. And so this point is 2008. And somebody is giving you a set of contacts purporting to be for Barack Obama in 2008, okay, he's just been elected president. Well, that means nothing really because, you know, anybody can create those uh, credentials at that point. If we've not got some other form of valid verification, it means nothing. So we've got zero for that work factor here. However, now imagine that somebody had done that back in 1990, you know, when Obama joined uh, Harvard Law School. Imagine that his credentials had been, you know, he put his contact information, his mesh fingerprint, not that it existed then, into a hash chain then and got his contacts notarized. Well, that would be really a lot more of a work factor because, you know, somebody who didn't think to impersonate him back in 1990 now needs a time machine to create that notarization event. And so although the work factor then could be would still be zero, the effort of going backwards in time, you know, the, only a person who attacked him then could get away with it afterwards. And what's more, we've got from 1990 to 2008, that's 28 years that that record has been sitting out there saying, I'm Barack Obama. And so we've got a whole challenge period in between. And so time stamping and notarization is a very powerful technique. And so the idea that I have is that as we are visiting conferences and so on, if there's a notarization service that's going there, every time we join a new society, join a new club, we've got the option of linking our credentials in to that notary chain. Okay, so that's the idea from the integrity side and proving who I am. There's a second side to it that comes from anonymity and wanting to allow me to deny or not at least not reveal that information unless I'm certain I want to reveal it. And that is where those message authentication code type integrity proofs come in. It allows me to prove who I am at the, at the um, conference, but in a way that I can only, you know, that proof is only usable by somebody if I give them the additional piece of information to complete the proof. And so, and you know, that's just one approach. Uh, part of the thing here is, you know, this is really for those of you who are undergraduates or graduate students, as making a better privacy pr protecting contact exchange mechanism 
is something that you could do for the final project. And then if we've got the mesh in place, the mesh would be an infrastructure that you could then try it out in the real world. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that what I've described here very roughly is not going to be the final answer in this space. But if we get the mesh out there and people are building up these contacts directories, that will provide the foundation to deliver whatever turns out to be that solution. So in this presentation, I've been focusing on the problem of contact exchange and showing you the techniques that the mesh enables. In the next video, I'm going to be looking at the third and final one of these mesh messaging applications, which is the confirmation protocol. And what the confirmation protocol does is it does second factor authentication, but in a way that finally makes sense. So please stick on for, along for that. Please hit like, please subscribe, and please help make the mesh and make the web a better place to be. Thank you.